introduction anxiety is everywhere. It always has been. But in the last several years, it has come to dominate our lives in a way that it perhaps never has. My own history with anxiety goes back much further. I'm a doctor, a psychiatrist, to be precise. Only after years of struggling to help my patients overcome their anxiety, continually feeling like I was missing something important in their treatment did I connect the dots between anxiety, my lab's neuroscience research on habit change, and my own panic attacks. And that's when everything changed. I had a light bulb moment when I realized that one of the reasons so many people fail to see that they have anxiety is the way it hides in bad habits. Now I think many more people are unavoidably aware of their anxiety. Whether or not they are trying to conquer a habit, I never planned to become a psychiatrist. In fact, I had no idea what type of doctor I wanted to be when I started medical school. I just knew that I wanted to bring together my love of science with my desire to help people. Combined MD, PhD programs are set up so that you spend the first couple of years in medical school, learning all of the facts and concepts. After that, you switch to your PhD years, focusing on a specific scientific field and learning how to do research. Then you go back to the wards and finish your third and fourth years of medical school before heading off to residency to specialize in a particular field of medicine. When I started medical school, I wasn't dead set on becoming a certain kind of doctor. I was simply fascinated by the complexity and beauty of human physiology and cognition and wanted to learn how this human system of ours worked. Typically, the first two years of medical school give medical students the time and space to start leaning toward a field they might want to specialize in. Then they confirm this decision during their hospital ward rotations in the third and fourth years. It takes eight or so years to complete a combined MD, PhD program. So I figured that I had plenty of time to discover what called to me and just focused on learning everything I could. It took me four years to complete my PhD, which was just enough time for me to forget everything I had learned in my first two years of medical school. So when I finished my PhD and went back to pick up where I had left off in medical school, I chose psychiatry as my first ward rotation so I could relearn everything I had forgotten about how to interview patients while I was off in PhD land. I had never thought of becoming a psychiatrist as they generally aren't portrayed positively in the movies. And in medical school I had heard the joke that psychiatry is for the lazies and the crazies. That is to say, you become a psychiatrist if you yourself are lazy or crazy. But that psychiatry rotation opened my eyes to what I could later look back on and say was a confluence of serendipity and timing. What I learned was that I absolutely loved being on the wards and really connected to the struggles of my psychiatric patients. I could see myself being perfectly happy trying to help them understand their minds so that they could more effectively work with their problems. While I loved most of my other ward rotations, nothing called to me quite as much as psychiatry. So that's the medical specialty that I chose. When I graduated from medical school and started my residency training at Yale, I found that not only was psychiatry a good fit for me, but I developed an even deeper connection to my patients who struggled with addictions. I had started meditating at the beginning of medical school and had continued doing so on a daily basis during my eight years of MD. PhD training. As I learned more about my addicted patients' struggles, I realized that they were talking about the same types of struggles that I had learned about in my own meditation training. Those connected feelings of craving, clinging, grasping. To my surprise, I found we shared a language and a struggle. Residency was also the period when I started having my own panic attacks, fueled by lack of sleep and the feeling that I didn't know anything. Combined with the uncertainty of being on call and never knowing when my beeper was going to go off in the middle of the night and what train wreck was going to be on the other end when I called the nursing station. All of this took a collective toll on my psyche. Talk about being able to empathize with my anxious patients. Fortunately, my meditation practice helped here as well. I was able to use my mindfulness skills to write out full-blown panic attacks that would wake me from sleep. Better yet, and I didn't know why at the time, these skills helped me not to add fuel to the fire of panic. I learned to work with anxiety and panic so that I didn't worry or freak out about having more panic attacks, which kept anxiety at bay and kept me from developing a true panic disorder. I also started to learn that I could teach people to become aware of uncomfortable feelings. I could give them a way to handle and work with their emotions that wasn't simply prescribing them a pill. Toward the end of my residency, I realized that virtually nobody was researching the science of meditation. Here was what seemed like a hidden gem, something that had helped me with extreme anxiety. And nobody was exploring why or how well it worked. So over the next decade, I threw myself into creating a program to help people overcome their harmful habits, which are strongly connected to and even driven by anxiety. In fact, anxiety is in and of itself a harmful habit. Now it is an epidemic. This book is the result of all that research. In the movie The Martian, Matt Damon's character has an oh shit moment when he realizes that he's stranded on Mars. During a windstorm, all of his buddies hightail it back to the safety of their spaceship and leave him for dead. 
He sits down in his little Martian outpost, wearing his cute little NASA hoodie, and tries to cheer himself up with a rousing speech. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm going to have to science the shit out of this, says Matt, taking up Matt Damon's inspiration. In this book I have science the shit out of anxiety. There are loads of books out there about these topics, thick ones and thin ones, some with catchy titles, fantastic stories, and secret methods or hacks for success. But not all of them are, shall we say, overflowing with actual brain science. I can promise you there is plenty of science in this book. And it's actual science, based on studies my lab has done over many years and with real participants. I've also published the papers that other people read and write books about, so we're covered there, too. I've been doing research for decades and I've loved learning and discovering new things. But I'd have to say, the single most interesting and important connection that I've made is the link between anxiety and habits. Why we learn to get anxious. And how even that becomes a habit. Making that connection has answered the question of why we worry, which has satisfied some of my scientific curiosity about anxiety. But more important, it has been critical for helping my patients understand and work with their own anxiety. You see, anxiety hides in people's habits. It hides in their bodies as they learn to disconnect from these feelings through myriad different behaviors. Seeing this connection, I could now help my patients understand how they had formed habits around everything from drinking too much alcohol to stress eating to procrastinating as a way to deal with anxiety. I could also help them see why they were struggling so much and failing to overcome both anxiety and their other habits. Anxiety would feed the other behaviors, which would then perpetuate their anxiety, until all would spiral out of control landing them in my office. One of the main things I've learned is that in psychiatry, the maxim the less you know, the more you say is applicable. In other words, the less you understand about a topic or situation, the more you fill that void with words. More words don't equal a better interpretation or more insight for your patients. In fact, when you don't know what you are talking about, the more words you use, the greater the chances are that you will dig yourself into a hole. And when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging, right? It was a painful lesson to learn, but I realized that the less you know, the more you say applied to me as much as to anyone. Imagine that. I wasn't some exception to the rule, where I could go on spouting nonsense as if the more I talked, the more it helped my patients. If I did precisely the opposite, that is, I kept my mouth shut, tried out some of that zendo no mind, and waited until I saw some clear connection instead of trying to sound like a psychiatrist. I could actually really help people. The less is more adage applies to domains outside of psychiatry as well like science. As I spoke less and listened more, I realized that the concepts I was developing concerning habit change kept boiling down and down, simplifying themselves as they went. But as a scientist, I had to be careful not to believe my own hype. The concepts were simple, but did they actually work? And could they work in settings beyond my outpatient clinic? So back in 2011, when my first big clinical trial for smoking cessation showed a whopping five times greater quit rate for my program than the gold standard treatment, I started exploring how we could use those weapons of mass distraction to help people overcome bad habits. I science the shit out of that, too, finding that we could get remarkable results in real clinical trials. And by remarkable, I mean a 40% reduction in craving-related eating in people who are obese, overweight, a 63% reduction in anxiety in people with generalized anxiety disorder, and so on. We even showed that app-based training could target specific brain networks related to smoking. Yes, with an app, the results of my clinical psychiatry practice, research, and concept distillation make up this book, which I hope will be a useful and pragmatic guide to changing how you understand anxiety so that you can work with it effectively. And as a bonus, break all those unhelpful habits and addictions. Part 0 Understanding Your Mind A problem can't be solved by the same consciousness that created it. Internet meme attributed to Albert Einstein. You may be wondering why I'm calling the beginning of this book Part 0 instead of Part 1. It's because part one is what happens once you understand what is going on. Part zero is all about what happens before you are even conscious of being anxious. Keep this in mind as you read. Part zero will teach you the psychology and neuroscience of how anxiety gets set up, giving you the framework with which to start working with it. Part one will show you how to identify anxiety triggers. Part two will help you understand why you get stuck in cycles of worry and fear and how to update your brain's reward network so that you can get unstuck. Part 3 will teach you simple tools that tap into your brain's learning centers to break anxiety cycles for good. Chapter 1 Anxiety Goes Viral Anxiety is like pornography. It's hard to define, but you sure know it when you see it. Unless, of course, you can't see it. In college, I was a type of go-getter who loved a challenge. I grew up in Indiana as one of four kids of a single mother. And when it came time to pick a college, 
I applied to Princeton because my college counselor told me I'd never get in. When I arrived on campus, I felt like a kid in a candy store. I was blown away by all of the opportunities that I was exposed to and wanted to do everything. I tried out for an a cappella singing group, joined the crew team, played in the orchestra, led backpacking trips for the outdoor program, rode for the cycling team, learned how to rock climb, joined a whimsical running group called the Hash House Harriers, and much more. I loved my college experience so much that I stayed on campus each summer, where I cut my teeth in the lab learning how to do research. Oh, and I supplemented my chemistry degree with a certificate in music performance to round out my education. Four years went by like a blur. As I was nearing the end of my senior year, preparing to head to medical school, I made an appointment to see the doctor at Student Health, because despite all of my activity, I was feeling distinctly unhealthy. I was getting severe bloating and stomach cramps, accompanied by a dash for the bathroom urgency to relieve my bowels like I'd never had before. It got so bad that I had to plan my daily running routes to make sure I was within pooping distance of a bathroom. When I explained my symptoms to the doctor, he asked inquisitively if I could possibly be stressed or anxious. I blurted out something to the effect of no way that was impossible. Because I exercised every day, ate healthfully, played the violin, and on and on, while he patiently listened, my anxiety-denying mind spat out a plausible possibility. I had recently led a backpacking trip, so I must not have correctly purified my water. It must be Jodiasis, an amoebic infection that you get from drinking unpurified water in wilderness settings that manifests as severe diarrhea. I posited to the doctor as convincingly as possible. Yes, he knew what Jodiasis was, and no, my symptoms didn't sound quite like actual Jodiasis. I didn't want to see what was staring me in the face. I was so stressed out that my anxiety was showing up in my body, because my mind was either ignoring the anxiety or in frank denial of it. Anxious. No way. Not me. After I spent about ten minutes trying to convince the doctor that I couldn't possibly be anxious, nor did I have something that the doctor called irritable bowel syndrome, he shrugged his shoulders and wrote me a prescription for the antibiotic that would supposedly clear my guts of gyardia, the theoretical cause of my diarrhea. Of course, my symptoms continued until I finally learned that anxiety is quite a shape-shifter, ranging from a little bit of nervousness before a test to full-blown panic attacks to even the bowel-emptying blowouts that forced me to keep the locations of all the public restrooms in Princeton, New Jersey, in my head. The online dictionary defines anxiety as a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. This encompasses, well, just about anything since any event that is about to happen is imminent and the only thing we can be certain about is that things are uncertain. Anxiety can rear its head in just about any place, situation, or time of day. We can have a little pinprick of anxiety when a colleague in a meeting puts up a slide about the company's quarterly results, or a shot of anxiety when those results are followed by said colleague saying that there will be layoffs in the coming weeks and the powers that be aren't sure just how many people will lose their jobs. Some people wake up with anxiety in the morning that nervousness prodding them awake like a hungry cat, followed by unshakable worry that spins them more and more awake and builds throughout the day because they can't figure out why they are anxious. This is the case for my patients with generalized anxiety disorder, who wake up anxious, worry their way through the day, and then continue their binge worrying late into the night, fueled by thoughts of why can't I get to sleep. Other folks have panic attacks that come out of the blue or that wake them from sleep in the middle of the night. Still others worry about specific things or themes, yet oddly are unaffected by other events or categories that one would think should drive them bonkers. And of course it would be very unpsychiatrist-like of me to not mention that there is quite a lengthy list of anxiety disorders. Despite my medical training, I'm a bit hesitant to label things as disorders or conditions myself. Because as you'll see shortly, a lot of this stuff shows up simply from a slight misalignment of one of our brain's natural processes. It's like labeling being human as a condition. When conditions happen, I think of the mind. Brain is more akin to a violin string that has gone slightly out of tune. In this situation, we don't label the instrument as defective and throw it away, but instead listen to what is wrong and tighten the strings a bit so we can continue making music. Yet for diagnostic and billing purposes, anxiety disorders run the orchestral gamut from specific phobias to obsessive compulsive disorder to generalized anxiety disorder. What flips the switch from everyday anxiety to disorder is somewhat in the eye of the diagnostician. For example, to meet a threshold for a diagnosis of GAD, someone must have excessive anxiety and worry about a variety of topics, events, or activities. And this must occur more often than not for at least six months and is clearly excessive. I love that last part, 
clearly excessive. Maybe I slept through the medical school lecture on how to determine exactly when worry moves from insufficiently to clearly excessive and signal that it's time to pull out my prescription pad or call in the meds because anxiety generally lives internally rather than manifesting itself as a big growth on the side of someone's head. I have to ask my patients a bunch of questions to see how their anxiety shows up. I certainly didn't know that I was anxious back in college until I put two and two together and finally connected my keeping track of all the bathrooms on my running route to worry. For the medical manuals, some of the typical symptoms of anxiety include edginess, restlessness, tiring easily, impaired concentration, irritability, increased muscle aches, and difficulty sleeping. But as you can clearly see, these symptoms by themselves don't pin a this person is anxious sign on your back for everyone to read. Critically, similar to my experience denying that I was anxious in college. I have to help my patients make the link between these manifestations and what's going on inside their head before we can move forward to help highlight how differently anxiety can show up in a person's life. Let me give you two examples from high-powered, put-together women. My wife, Mari, a 40-year-old college professor who is beloved by her students and internationally known for her research, can't remember when her anxiety came of age. It wasn't until she was in graduate school and had a conversation on this topic with her sister and cousin that she started recognizing family mannerism as manifestations of anxiety. Putting a label on what seems quirky in isolation but is blazingly clear as a pattern was a light bulb moment for her. She put it this way, anxiety was so subtle that it wasn't until we could name it in our family that we could recognize it in ourselves. She noticed that her grandmother, her mother, and her aunt all had some level of anxiety, and that this had been the case for as long as she could remember. For example, when Mari was a kid, her mom would get caught up in excessive planning as a way to try to control her situations. This was especially evident when they were going on a trip. Mari hated getting ready for traveling because her mom's anxiety would show up in the form of snapping at her. Her father and her sister. Only when Mari could recognize anxiety in her family members did she realize that she had it as well. In a not-so-formal, before-breakfast interview for this book, she reflected about what anxiety feels like to her. It is a low-grade feeling that has no object in itself. It attaches to any particular situation or thought that it can. It's as though my mind is looking for something to be anxious about. It's a feeling that I would previously have labeled as nervousness about certain things. It was hard to disconnect from my life experiences because I thought it was just attached to legitimate life changes and circumstances. Yes, this is a key characteristic of generalized anxiety. Our mind picks an innocuous object and starts worrying about it. For many, anxiety is a wildfire in the wilderness that starts with the strike of a match at dawn and is fueled by everyday experiences, burning brighter and stronger as the day unfolds. At the end of our conversation as we headed to breakfast, Mari added, people who don't know me wouldn't suspect that this is something that I'm always working with, shrink training or not. I can attest to that. She comes across as cool as a cucumber to her colleagues and college students. Yet both she and I can sense the times when she's anxious, often being clued in by her focusing on something in the future and starting to plan. It's as though her brain picks an object or period that has a bit of inherent uncertainty, starts to rev up simply because it lacks form, and then with each mental planning stroke tries to mold that clay into a familiar shape. To artists, a block of clay says possibility. To travelers, a weekend promises adventure. To the nervous, that lack of structure screams anxiety. Mari and I have a running joke in which I ask her some variation of have you planned this morning to plan this afternoon to plan for the evening. In contrast to the slow burn of generalized anxiety, some people have intermittent periods of panic. Consider Emily, Mari's college roommate. As an attorney, Emily works on high-level political issues, including international negotiations. When she was in law school, she started having panic attacks. I asked her to explain what those were like for her. In an email response, she described them, it was the summer between my second and third years of law school, when I was fortunate enough to have scored a summer associate position at a big law firm. As a summer associate, you are often invited to the homes of firm partners for dinner with their families, and a few other summers and full-time associates. It is supposed to be a bonding experience and lets you see what personal life is like for those who worked at the firm. After one of these dinners in July, which was indeed enjoyable, I came home and went to bed, falling asleep easily. About two hours later, however, I jolted awake, heart pounding, sweating, gasping for air. I had no idea what was wrong. I couldn't remember having any sort of bad dream or anything. I quickly got out of bed and walked around, trying to stop it. I was so worried that I called my husband, who was working an overnight shift at the emergency department of a hospital, and begged him to come home which he did. My symptoms eventually eased, and I realized I would survive, but I still didn't quite understand what had happened. 
as I returned to law school for my final year that fall, with a full-time job offer from the firm in hand. I relaxed and didn't have any other incidents that I can remember, but by the next summer, the panic attacks returned, almost always the same as before jolting me awake just a few hours after falling asleep easily. I was studying for the bar exam, which is a miserable experience, and simultaneously my parents, who had been married for 30 years, suddenly announced they were getting divorced. In addition, as I started my new job at the law firm, working some very long hours, an older associate whose office was right next to mine decided to haze me and treat me like his property, lecturing me about how I had no control over my life because the firm basically owned me and how grateful I should be for this opportunity. This horrible combination of events, circumstances, seemingly stripping me of control over what I understood to be my life, led to a series of panic attacks over a six-month time period. I saw a therapist for a few sessions and did my own research, and by this point recognized what was happening. Once I knew what it was, I felt like I had more control. I would tell myself, you feel like you're going to die, but you won't. This is your brain playing games with you. You decide what happens next. I learned how to deep breathe my way out of an attack and focus my thoughts intensely on the very act of calming down. Now, not everyone has the Mr. Spock, like superhuman reasoning and focus of Emily. Yet in contrast to Mari's description of the slow burn of generalized anxiety, Emily's story shows how anxiety can be like a tea kettle, heating up and heating up until it blows. Often in the middle of the night, and critically for both Emily and Mari, it wasn't until they could name their particular variety of anxiety that they could start working with it whether someone is a bona fide physician or simply Dr. Google. The bottom line here is that anxiety, clinical or otherwise, is a bit of a sticky wicket to diagnose. We all get anxious, it's a part of life. Yet how we deal with it is critical. If we don't know how anxiety shows up or why, we might get caught up in temporary distractions or short-term fixes that actually feed it, creating bad habits in the process. Or we might spend our whole lives adding to our anxiety by trying to cure it. That's what this book is all about. Together, we'll explore how anxiety grew out of our brain's very basic survival mechanisms, how it can even become a self-perpetuating habit, and what you can do to change your relationship to it so that it unwinds on its own. Here's the bonus. In the process, you'll also learn about how it can set other habits in motion. Anxiety is not new. In a letter to John Adams back in 1816, Thomas Jefferson wrote, there are indeed gloomy and hypochondriac minds, inhabitants of diseased bodies, disgusted with the present, and despairing of the future, always counting that the worst will happen, because it may happen. To these I say how much pain have cost us the evils which have never happened. One while I'm not even close to a historian, I can imagine Jefferson had quite a bit to be anxious about, from helping to birth a new country to living with his hypocritical attitude towards slavery. In our modern world, with technological advances helping to provide a more stable food supply in the United States now being about a quarter of a millennium old. We might expect that there is less to worry about. B.C., that is, before COVID-19, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America estimated that 264 million people worldwide had an anxiety disorder 3 in a study that now seems ancient because the data were collected between 2001 and 2003. The National Institute of Mental Health reported that 31% of U.S., Adults experience an anxiety disorder sometime in their lives, and that 19% of the population had an anxiety disorder within the past year for over the past two decades, things have only gotten worse. In 2018, the American Psychological Association surveyed a thousand U.S. adults about their sources and levels of anxiety. The APA found that 39% of Americans reported being more anxious than they were in 2017 and an equal amount had the same level of anxiety as the last year five that's nearly 80% of the population. Where is all of this anxiety coming from? The same APAP poll found that 68% of respondents reported worries about health and safety made them somewhat or extremely anxious. Some 67% of folks reported finances as their source, followed by politics and interpersonal relationships. In their Stress in America survey, the APAP found that 63% of Americans felt that the future of the nation was a large source of stress, and 59% checked the box that the United States is at the lowest point they can remember in history six remember. This was back in 2017, three years before COVID-19 hit, based on observations that mental illness tends to be more common in regions of the United States that also have a lower socioeconomic status. Some have wondered whether less wealthy countries, where basic needs such as steady sources of food, clean water, and safety might be substantial stressors, would have higher rates of anxiety. To address this question, a study published in JAMA Psychiatry in 2017 looked at rates of generalized anxiety disorder across the globe 7 ready for this. Lifetime prevalence was highest in high-income countries, lower in middle-income countries, 
and lowest in low-income countries. The authors opine that individual differences in the tendency to worry may show up more under conditions of relative wealth and stability found in high-income countries. Speculation proliferates as to why this is. For example, having our basic needs met may provide more idle time to let our survival brains look for something to be threatened by or worried about leading some to dub this population the worried well. Yet people with GAD are far from healthy. Half of the individuals in this study reported severe disability in one or more life domains. I think of my patients with GAD as Olympians in the endurance sport of anxiety. They can worry longer and harder than anyone else on the planet. With the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, early estimates report that anxiety levels skyrocketed. A cross-sectional survey of people in China from February 2020 found the prevalence of GAD to be 35.2%. And this was relatively early in the grand scheme of the pandemic. A report from the United Kingdom from late April 2020 reported that mental health had deteriorated compared with pre COVID 19 trends. Nine, a study in the United States in April 2020 found that 13.6% of respondents reported severe psychological distress. 10, that's a whopping 250% increase compared to 2018, where only 3.9% reported this level of woe. You only have to look as far as your own experience or social media feed to confirm this for yourself. Large-scale disasters such as the COVID-19 pandemic are almost always accompanied by increases in a broad range of mental disorders, including substance use and anxiety. For example, nearly 25% of New Yorkers reported increasing their alcohol use after the 9-11 attack back in 2001 and six months after the 2016 Fort McMurray wildfire. Area residents showed a spike to 19.8% in generalized anxiety disorder symptoms 11 12. Anxiety isn't a loner. It tends to hang out with friends. That same JAMA study from 2017 found that 80% of people with GAD experienced another lifetime psychiatric disorder, most commonly depression. A recent study from my lab found something similar. 84% of individuals with GAD presented with comorbid disorders, and anxiety doesn't just come out of the blue. It is born. 